Derek Beaulieu, vous publiez euh, un livre euh, bilingue chez euh, Jean Boite Édition, A, a Novel, euh, qui est une traduction de, du livre d'Andy Warhol, euh, du roman d'Andy Warhol, intitulé, qui a le même titre, A, a Novel. Euh, et le principe est que vous avez euh, effacé, retiré tous les mots euh, pour ne laisser que les indications, les didascalies, on dirait, euh, au théâtre, et, euh, et puis les ponctuations. Euh, j'avais vu qu'avant, un, un autre de vos livres précédents euh, s'intitulait « No more poetry euh, <rire> ». Est-ce que vous pensez qu'il faut euh, effacer, comme vous l'avez fait là avec les mots d'Andy Warhol, effacer la, po la poésie Je ne pense pas qu'il faut effacer la poésie, mais je pense que les gens qui font la plus mauvaise ou la plus intéressante poésie sont des poètes. Les gens qui font la plus mauvaise représentatives de la poésie sont des poètes. Poets. Poets, I don't believe, are forward-thinking. I don't think they are adventuresome. I don't think they are taking risks. I think that poetry, for the most part, is falling back on what it did a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, and thinking that that is enough. Mm. We don't need to do any more because we already know what poetry can do. And books like this and others are, I hope, poets looking at the edges of poetry and saying, we cannot be satisfied with what we've done. This is, when you look at a traditional poem, we need to be finding a way that actually reflects writing in the 21st century, that reflects writing today, or to, that reflects anything that has happened in terms of the avant-garde or in terms of art in the last hundred years. Somebody like Brian Geisen, hmm. he was the, uh, the Canadian experimental poet. He worked uh, a lot with William Burroughs argued in the 1950s that poetry is 50 years behind writing. That was 50 years ago. 50 years ago we were 50 years behind. We're no longer 50 years behind. We're easily 100 years behind. We haven't figured out what to do with cubism. We haven't figured out what to do with impressionism, let alone minimalism or uh, uh, you know any sort of other practice. And poets need to They need to be smarter. Mais est-ce que ça signifie, Derek Beaulieu, qu'aujourd'hui, les gens qui seraient le plus poètes ne savent pas qu'ils sont poètes Do you think the, that people that are making the most interesting poetry today don't know their poets Yes, and uh, I hope so. Uh, I think that the people who are making the most interesting poetry today are making work online, they're making digital work, they're on Instagram, they're on Twitter, they're, they're, they're using the tools That's the thing. They're using the tools to write that everybody uses. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. But poets don't use those tools. Those tools are too new, too today. So Too dirt, dirty? Too dirty, too non-artistic. But once we actually find how those tools can be swerved or brought into a practice, into an arts practice, that's going to take poetry and turn it on its head. That's going to make us, all of us, have to rethink what we think poetry is. So for my previous collection that was called Please, uh, No More Poetry, uh, starting with please because I'm Canadian and we're very <laughs> polite, um, it's not that I want poetry to be gone. I want poetry the way we've seen it for so many years to maybe step aside so we can make some space for risk or things that I don't even know are coming. That's the poetry that I'm excited to, to see. Alors, dans, dans ce livre euh, « A, a novel », votre traduction du livre d'Andy Warhol, donc vous partez d'un texte d'Andy Warhol qui était lui-même euh, un enregistrement, euh, la retranscription d'enregistrement euh, fait par lui, il suivait un personnage, une personne, et, voilà. et euh, donc était une forme d'auto, quelque chose d'automatique. Mais pourquoi encore Andy Warhol Il est l'une de ces figures que je pense que l'écriture n'a pas trouvé ce qu'il faut faire avec. Et je pense que l'autre, il y en a deux... Uh, there are two people I'm speaking to in this book. And one of them is named, and that's Warhol. The other one is unnamed, and he's standing in the background, and that's John Cage. And John Cage's um, epic um, piece of music, 433, 4 minutes and 33 seconds, is often referred to as a blank score, a silent performance. It's not silent. You pick up the sheet music, and it's just the stave and bar and nothing else. And he asks musicians to get up on stage 
and, and stand basically at the edge of performance and just wait there. Mm -hmm. And that the audience has to retune their ears and that the, the, the sound of the performance is the sound of the hall, right? It's the sound of shuffling paper and squeaking in your seats and coughing and rustling papers and that that becomes the symphony. That becomes the beautiful orchestral moment, mm -hmm. right? And so when I was looking at Warhol's book, a, a novel which was published in 1968, he had done something um, which on the surface looks like it has nothing to do with Cage at all. He asked um, uh, Robert Oliva, uh, Undine, to, to um, wear a voice activated tape recorder around his neck and record all the, all the conversations he had over a series of weekends. And it's, they're inane, boring conversations between um, people who work in the arts community uh, so it's about what drugs they're taking and who they're sleeping with and, you know, what parties they want to go to and um, gossiping about each other and complaining about the noise and just, just conversations. And so on the surface, it looks like it is just a portrait of the words we use. But it, it comes across as very New York, 1966, 1967. It's all the, the, the talk, right? But it's a portrait not of the conversations, not of the arts community, it's a portrait of the city. And I wanted to hear the city. And so I, I wanted to turn down the volume on the voices. Not to turn up the city, just turn down the volume so I could hear the city rattle around behind it. The rhythm, you mean? The rhythm of the city, the sound of the city, the, 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 the coming and going, the voices, the screeching, the, like everything else that happens. And I needed to quiet the voices so I could hear the traffic. And when you open up uh, a page of a novel, it looks like, originally you think, well, there's nothing here. Mm -hmm. It's just punctuation marks, right? But as you start looking, that the punctuation marks start forming the grid of the streets. It's like the map of New York City. And then on, on occasional pages, you start seeing the sound of the city come forward. So on this page, elevator door opens. Car zoom by. Traffic noise. And on this side, we just have the silent grid. Right? Noise. Honk, 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 honk! And I think it was, I think it's very useful to see this as a, as a Cajian score. Mm -hmm. Like it's something mm -hmm. like John Cage is doing. Is that I just want, these are not silent. It's not a silent book. It's a very noisy book. But it's not the noises that we see as poetry. Mm -hmm. Nor is it the, no, the noises that we see as a novel. A novel is supposed to have all this other stuff going on character and plot and conflict and love and heartbreak and all this stuff could there be a better novel than the city itself mm. just let the city speak its story right you know if you imagine just let the streets of paris speak for themselves get out of the way and let the architecture and the traffic and the noise and the you know the the pigeons that let that be the novel of paris and that's what i tried to do here um warhol i think is haunting um, writing in all sorts of ways because he was taking risks in terms of the visual arts that we're still trying to figure out how to take in the written arts, whether it be transcription or just taking an image and moving it over here or hiring other people to do his prints for him. Mm -hmm. Can you think of a novelist that would like, I'm not going to write my books, I'm going to ask someone else to write my books and sign them. You know, like those kind of risks are important risks for novelists to be taking. Mm -hmm. And we are still trying to find out. And Warhol is one of those figures that we can look to for inspiration. And do you think you could or do you plan to make performances with, with <laughs> the book as a partition? That's, that's the big question. And I know that that question has come up many times. Um, and I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I, that, those are the books I want to write. I want to write the books that I learn from as we go. So one of the challenges that I did... Uh, in the construction of this book was each time I wrote a poem, each time I, I wrote one of these pieces, a page out of this novel, when I finished it, I posted it up on Twitter mm -hmm. each day. So each, poem, each piece is up on Twitter, uh, the whole book. And then I invited uh, friends of mine from around the world who are composers or musicians to take any pages they want and perform them. See how they would interpret that into sound what they would do with it, and see how a book like this could be seen as a, pro a provocation. 
a, a, or a musical score. What do you do? I'm not interested in performing it myself, necessarily, because I'm afraid that my performance will become the authoritative one, that what I do uh, is the only way to do it. And I'd rather it be a spot where I can be surprised too, that I can hand this over to a musician and say, how would you perform this? Mm -hmm. And what comes back is, is a total shock. So the uh, Canadian composer Gary Barwin um, created a whole series of pieces where he typed the pages out on a typewriter with a series of contact mics. So each comma went poof, poof, you know, like these beautiful echoey sounds and then scored that. Uh, another person uh, in Florida saw all these pieces as um, the sounds of a clock and created syncopated clock sounds and basically tick-tocked his way through these various pages. That's what we want poetry to be. That's where we want fiction to be. It's not something that you just passively receive. But I think that the best response to a piece of artwork is another piece of artwork. Right? Is like, how do we see this as something that generates a conversation? Not just like, oh, well, thank you, and put it aside. Right? But it should be provocative. It should be, now what do you do? There's a 450-page novel in front of you with no words in it. How do you respond? It <laughs> cannot be just flip through it and put it aside. Mm -hmm. It needs you to respond to it. Et on comprend que le uncreative writing, c'est de l'écriture peut-être surcreative, d'après ce que vous dites. Uh, uncreative writing is the is the uh, poetic or writerly focus on non-poetic ways of writing. It's how to create a piece of poetry or a piece of fiction with without using the traditional tools. So it looks to, it looks to uh, digital composition. How do we write online? It looks to um, appropriation. How do we steal and recontextualize? It looks to um, symbols and signs. So uh, concrete poetry and sound poetry. And it, it looks to these forms as, as, as alternates to the the tradition of poetry in the 20th and 19th century. Merci beaucoup d'être passé par ici, Derek Beaulieu. My pleasure. Thank you.